Well, uh, our work is uh, spread over a number of areas. So, so we have, there are people in the lab who do very basic uh, conceptual kind of uh, stuff that's uh, almost philosophy. And then uh, computer, mm -hmm. there's some computer science and there's some uh, bench work in developmental biophysics and uh, there's some behavioral science and things like that. And uh, we have a we have a mix of of uh, biologists, physicists, bioengineers, computer scientists, and so on. And there are you know there are, there are there are lots of projects in in areas such as birth defects, regeneration, uh, moving towards regenerative medicine, cancer, um, AI, uh, uh, unconventional com computing, and unconventional um, cognition, and things like that. And all of it, it's it sounds like a grab bag of a hundred different things, but it's actually all stemming from one fundamental question that I'm interested in and that I've been interested in since I was a kid, which is really this issue of uh, embodied mind, you know, this, this, this issue of how minds can exist in uh, the universe, how uh, they interact with their bodies, how minds scale from the uh, primitive uh, kinds of um, metabolic and, and other competencies of single cells to the emergent mind of the, of the body and then of the, of the whole organism in a behavioral sense. And uh, this, this scaling embodiment and uh, communication is, is at the root of everything. So it's at the root of developmental biology. It's, it's, the, it's a way that we think about uh, the task of regenerative medicine is to communicate with this collective intelligence of cells to get it to do various things. Um, and then, of course, applications to robotics and AI and so on. So that's sure. kind of the, the field of the group. As I just mentioned, this, this paper of yours, it tackles so much um, in one could you possibly give us an overview of the paper? And um, I have a million questions to ask you in terms of specifics, but could you tell us what, um, what this paper is about? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've been thinking about these things for many, many years, but what, what finally catalyzed me sitting down and writing this up is that um, in 2018, there was a, uh, a conference on diverse intelligence uh, put on by the uh, Templeton Foundation. And we were we were challenged by our program officer Pranab Das to uh, think about frameworks where unconventional intelligences could all be thought about at the same time. And so we, there were people there working on uh, ants and octopuses and uh, uh, you know uh, chimpanzees and and, and things mm -hmm. like this. And I I uh, like with with a number of things I sort of um, tend to crank that knob all the way all the way out. And so, and so I'm interested in every kind of possible cognitive system. So we're talking uh, cells, tissues, minimal matter, uh, collective intelligence of groups of organisms, uh, all kinds of um, uh, artificial synthetic beings, uh, software AIs, possible aliens, like all of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I want to know what, 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 how, how we, how we detect, how we understand and how we relate to, and maybe even create uh, diverse intelligences. What is the space of possible minds? And, and I'm certainly not the first person to ask that question. Sure. So, so, so we were thinking about all this and, and I started to try to formalize, uh, the way that, uh, one could think about any possible, uh, uh cognitive system or any possible intelligence. And, and just to give it, to give it a definition by, by intelligence, I don't mean the kind of uh, second order metacognition that, for example, humans have, where you can sort of think about what you know and so on. I mean, that's mm. one kind, but, but I'm talking about when I say intelligence, I mean, William James is kind of definition where it's a competency to reach the same goal by different means. It's a very cybernetic mm. definition. It means mm -hmm. there's some problem space, there's some goal you're trying to reach in that problem space. It becomes a navigation task. And, and it asks you to think about for any given system, how much competency does the system have in navigating its world to reach its goal, uh, despite all kinds of new things happening, various barriers and 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 so on, and so, so this this so so I like that definition because mm -hmm. it uh, it it's it's independent of uh, the the origin of the system. It doesn't matter if you're evolved or designed or some hybrid. Uh, it doesn't because I I think I think that there are a lot of artificial distinctions that are made in in these various fields that are. Right. Uh, not facilitating progress they're they're kind of blocking it actually so so sure. I, I want i want things that are that are as unified as possible i really yeah. take this unification task seriously yeah. so i so i started thinking well what if you know if we can't if we can't rely on origin story uh because i don't think that matters um if we can't rely on composition because i don't think having a brain that looks like ours makes any difference here mm -hmm. uh 
what do cognitive systems have in common, right? What, what, what does it mean for something to have a code to, to have some kind of cognitive uh, system? And, um, and so, and so what I settled on is this notion of a cognitive light cone. And the idea is this, and this is borrowed from, uh, well, it's sort of upside down actually, but it's, but it's borrowed from, from, uh, from um, the way they do. Um, Minkowski may have been the first to do it, yeah. but, but these, uh, mm -hmm. these kind of space-time diagrams in physics. Sure. And what, so what you do is you put, you know, time is on the vertical axis, all of the dimensions of space are, are on, the, on the horizontal axis. And what you can define is you can define this cognitive light cone uh, as the spatiotemporal size of the biggest goal that the system can pursue. And I don't mean mm. the reach of its sensors and effectors, right? So, so the James Webb telescope has this incredible uh, sensory array that reaches to the edges of, 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 the, of the observable universe maybe uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about um, not not what you can sense and and where you can act. I'm talking about the size of the goal state that you are cap the largest goal state that you are capable of pursuing. So this this frames um, much like James and I think I think he was right and, and like Wiener uh, and colleagues before that. Uh, it frames the tasks of of uh, some type of cognition, whatever it is on that on that spectrum, as being fundamentally about pursuing goals of of some type. And so, and so one can sort of start with very simple. And so, so here it's a tick, but you can think about a, a bacterium or something. And, you know, it, it, it has a little bit of, uh, yeah, it has the, the, the cognitive light cone is quite small because it has a little memory going backwards and has a little bit of predictive power going forwards in time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what it really cares about is the local concentration of whatever molecules it cares about right at that local level. So it's very small. The sure. cognitive light cone is very small. And you can move up to something like a dog. So, so that has, has a longer uh, light cone going backwards. Uh, it has a little bit of predictive, more predictive capacity going forwards. And of course, spatially, it will know things like one of the goals is to, is to keep intruders out of its neighborhood, the, 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 perif the perimeter of the house or whatever sure. it is. That, that, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's what it works on. But so, so that's great. That's way bigger than the, than the tick but, um, or the bacterium. But what you're never going to get your dog to do, as far as we know, is to care about what happens in the town three miles over a month from now. It's mm -hmm. it's just not going to happen. They're not capable right. of it as, as far mm -hmm. as we know. And and then and then you have very large light cones like humans uh, that may really be, well, one of the goals may be something to do with world peace and uh, what's going to happen. You know, some people are li literally depressed because the sun's going to burn out, and so they're working on uh, these technologies to get us off the planet and 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 mm -hmm. so on. So. So you could, and, and, and of course we all have limitations, right? So, so even though the human light cone is, is huge and it does have this interesting feature, maybe the first one in this evolutionary chain, maybe not, where some of those goals are guaranteed not attainable. Yeah, so, so if you're a goldfish mm. and you have some goals that reach, let's say a half an hour forward, that's absolutely attainable. You're very likely to live that long. And so your goal, most all of your goals are, are attainable. If you're a mm. human, it's very likely that you know that many of your goals are your, your, your cognitive light cone is longer than your lifespan. You know they're not attainable. And that may or may not result in some psychological pressures that are unique, but, but I, I don't know. So, so, so our cognitive light cones can be huge, but, but they're also limited in that, for example, and this becomes important in some of our more, more recent work, uh, if you think about the capacity to, I mean, what, what this is fundamentally about is, is, is care and compassion. And mm -hmm. if, if you think about uh, your, your capacity to care about the welfare of other beings, we are quite limited in the in the linear range. So, so you know, you might have a certain amount of amount of uh, care about something that happens to some number of people, but if it's then, you know, if you're told that, well, actually, it's not uh, it's not a thousand people. It was actually ten thousand people that it happened to. You, your amount of, of of active care is not going up tenfold. We just can't muster that that level, right? But you could imagine, and 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 you know, you could imagine these sort of bodhisattva like beings with that, whose light cone is large enough where they can actually they, they can literally care about uh, a, a you know a massive amount of, of possible uh, possible uh, sentient beings so anyway so that so that's that's the point of this cognitive light cone and the idea behind all of this and there's a there's a follow-up paper uh, from uh, from last year that's kind of the um the the next version of this which is the tame paper the tame the technological approach to mind everywhere which extends this and 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 really goes into this uh the, the, the mechanics of what this, what this is supposed to be. What this is supposed to be is um, a framework that moves these kind of questions, questions of uh, cognition, of sentience, of, uh, of, of um, intelligence, and so on, 
from the area of philosophy where people have a lot of philosophical feelings and preconceptions about um, what things can do and what things can't do. And it really, uh, really stresses the idea that you, you can't just have feelings about this stuff. You have to make testable claims. And so, so every claim about a system of some level of, of competency, you say this thing doesn't have uh, this level of cognition or it does, wherever you are on the spectrum, and it has to be a spectrum, it's not binary, that's the biggest thing that trips everybody up is trying to be binary about these things. But wherever you are on the spectrum, that is a testable claim. So somebody has picked out, somebody has to pick out a problem space, uh, say what you think the goal is, say what you think the system is capable of doing to reach that goal, and then you test it. And then you see if what you've got facilitates discovery, experiment, uh, further research, and so on. So all of these. So so I, you know, for, for me, the goal of all of this is to uh, make make uh, uh, testable um, frameworks that that advance a research program. They're not they're not just just philosophy. One of the points you made uh, you you made in a few podcasts is that all intelligence is collective intelligence. Yeah. Um, we are a collection of cells, and I think that's. Such a wonderful point because we do kind of get lost in the um, in the philosophical debates. Let's say in terms of thinking of it as a singular kind of yeah. pointed focus. I believe it's from the paper that most biological systems consist of multiple nested cells. And how is that different than say one say integrated self? Because I think you actually point out it's not one as implied by integrated information theory. Could you talk, tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Um... Yeah. So, so, so this this uh, collective uh, intelligence thing is is crucial because a lot of thought in uh, in in philosophy, uh, so going all the way back to uh, Rene Descartes and before that, you know, Descartes, which I, I think he gets a bad rap for a lot of things. I I, I like him actually, but what, what, but but one of the things that that I think he was he was wrong about is that he was he was really interested in the pineal gland because he said there's only one of these mm. in the brain, right? And so that makes sense mm. as a kind of a a, a nexus sure. for the, this 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 unified human human and um, cognition and so on. But but actually, if he had had access to uh, some some good microscopy, he would have found out there's not one of anything. If you look into this pineal gland, what you see is a whole bunch of cells. And when you look into those cells, you see a whole bunch of molecular networks and down it goes. There isn't really one of anything. And so what we have to ask ourselves is... Uh, where does this large scale, because we, we certainly, as, as, a, as an organism, you certainly have a light cone that does not belong to any of your pieces. So you have goals and preferences and hopes and dreams in uh, spaces that do not belong to your individual cells and tissues and organs. They work in, in um, uh, physiological space and transcriptional space. And, and when you're an embryo, they worked in morphogenetic space. Uh, you, you work in three-dimensional space and maybe linguistic space and maybe some other things. But um, so, so certainly there's a kind of scale-up process by which these competent subunits, and that's one thing we have to understand is that we are made of very competent subunits. We are not, I, I give another talk mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's called um, uh, why, why Robots Don't Get Cancer. Right. And, so, right, and, and the reason... Yeah. The reason that our current technologies don't ever get cancer is because they're they tend to be made of pretty passive parts. So mm -hmm. you hope that your robot is has some degree of of intelligent performance, but the parts themselves never go off the reservation and do something you know something uh, something else. Right. And so, uh, but 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 with us, that's a definite risk because that's the uh, that's the that's the price you pay for 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 having a, those scaling mechanisms. You uh, you 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 become. Um, susceptible to failure modes where where the individual parts they they have agendas uh mm -hmm. and 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 there are these these evolution has given us some some hardware which is very good at uh scaling up these these cognitive light cones and, and pivoting them into different spaces into different problem spaces but that has that has failure modes and i think i think it's it's really um critical to ask that question how the properties of the compound intelligence and, and the goals right the, because there are novel goals that appear and so on how those relate to the properties of the parts, what dynamics facilitate the scale up, how do, do they go wrong? Because at the level of, of tissues, for example, that's that's cancer. That's basically a disorder of this of this cognitive mm -hmm. scaling. It, it results in cancer. Um, and 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 all kinds of other other implications up and down, up and down the chain. And so, you know, the last thing, the last thing you mentioned was uh was about um I IIT. And uh re really the 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 one thing I would say is this, and that I I, I don't we, we haven't really gotten into consciousness at all, which is fine. I think it's really important to demarcate 
actual talk, talk of actual consciousness from from the stuff that we're talking about, which is which is um, cognition, intelligence, uh, performance, computation, and so on. 